Hello, thank you guys so much for coming tonight. Um, it's such a huge honor for me to uh, introduce Kristen. She is not only my best friend, but she is also one of my oldest friends in the world. We met 18 years ago last month at the old Alamo draft house that got demolished at the National Poetry Slam when she was running uh, the Urbana Slam in the basement of CBGB's. And she was 18, 19 years old. Um, so, uh, and uh, she has been working on this book almost that entire time that we've known each other. Uh, it started out as a screenplay project. She studied screenwriting at NYU and, uh, and wrote this, and discovered this story and wrote this amazing screenplay about it. And it actually got made into a short film uh, as one of the awards for the contest that she won, which you can view on my YouTube page. Because uh, I, I think it's amazing and a hint of, of what an amazing movie this book that she's written is going to be. But she... Uh, 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 she, after she won the screenplay award, like she didn't give up on the story and knew that there was, you know, she had found an amazing story. And it's one of the like longest periods of time I've ever known any of my friends to work on a project. And the culmination of it is so amazing. I'm, it's such an amazing book, and I'm so proud of her. So far, it's gotten a Kirkus starred review, a Publishers Weekly starred review, a Library Journal starred review, uh, and people are just raving about it. It's, I'm so proud of her. Uh, Kristen O'Keefe Aptowitz, anyway, everyone. <laughs> Great. Thanks, everybody. I think I think I just have a, a mic. So welcome uh, to the Dr. Mooters Marvel's book event here at Book People. I am so thrilled to be here. I moved here to finish writing this book because I got an NEA grant to support uh, writing this book. And I lived in New York City, and $25,000 does not pay anything in New York City, but it does in Austin. Yay! Thank you for your cheap breakfast tacos, <laughs> your affordable public transportation. Uh, so today I'm going to do something a little unusual. I'm going to give you a talk about what I love about Thomas Dent Mütter, and I'm going to have local poets here read excerpts from the book so that you get a taste of what the book is like. Uh, I'm going to try to do this as quickly as possible because I'm an obsessive nerd and I'm very excited about the subject matter so I can take a long time. P.S. There's some gory images so I apologize in advance if you ate anything that was red for dinner. Um, so the book is about this man, Dr. Thomas Dent Mütter, who's the founder of the Mütter Museum in Philadelphia. Some of you guys may know that museum. It's sort of a cult destination. It's a museum for uh, medical oddities. They wouldn't say that. They would say unusual pathological specimens. <laughs> but I grew up in Philadelphia, and I went to that museum in the fourth grade, sixth grade, eighth grade, and all throughout high school, never knowing the story of why it was founded. And that is what got me interested in the story that I wrote in Dr. Mütter's Marvels. So Thomas Detmutter was born in 1811 to these beautiful people, John Mutter and Lucinda Mutter. Um, they were very uh, well-off Virginians, very successful merchant. His wife was very well-read, and they had two sons, Tom first and then later James. But within seven years, the entire family, except for Tom, died, which was not unusual back in the 19th century. You would have infectious diseases that would ravage whole families, whole towns, and whole cities. Um, he was sent to live with his grandmother, and then the grandmother, too, passed away. And then he was, they tried to find a home for him, but he was sort of a jinx of a child. No one wanted to take the kid who everyone keeps dying around. But he eventually found a home here in Sabine Hall, uh, which is the home of the King Carter family of the South, if any of you remember that from seventh grade social studies. Uh, and Robert Carter was his guardian, and he, you know, had erratic support of him. Uh, he supported his education, but did not support what Mütter considered to be uh, incredibly important, which was his clothing. Even from a very young age, even as an orphan ward, he wanted to look really great. And it's sort of emblematic of the person he would later become. He realized a scam that he could perform, which is he could charge his clothing bill to his school and then earn scholarships to pay it off. So he began just charging all of this money. He got velvet vests and cigars and leghorn hats and just kept earning academic scholarships to pay it off. It did not work for very long. They stopped giving him money, and he got in a lot of trouble. But he, and he also sort of struggled with illness his entire life. You know, They didn't have antibiotics back then. Germ theory would not be proven until the end of the 19th century when the modern microscope was used. So infectious diseases could just hit you again and again and again. And he was in college when he decided he wanted to be more ambitious than the South and go to Yale. He had never experienced a northern winter and was incredibly felled by disease, just constantly coughing up blood. He came back south to get a diagnosis and met with doctors who were unlike any doctors that he had ever known before. Um, back then in the 19th century, you did not need a medical degree to practice medicine. You could or could not apprentice under another doctor. Essentially, you just put a placard out 
and that was it. And common treatments were purging, uh, bleeding, leeching, uh, drinking mercury was also very popular. Um, and sometimes the treatments made you even sicker than if you had never done anything at all. But he met these doctors who were empathetic to him and treated him uh, like an individual, not as a disease to be cured, but as a person whose suffering needed to be alleviated. And that became his calling. He knew in that moment that he wanted to be a doctor. And if you were to study medicine anywhere in America in the early half of the 19th century, you would study it here in Philadelphia, uh, the place where I was born. It does not look like this anymore, but it did look like this during Mütter's time. Philadelphia was the home of the first ever medical school, University of Pennsylvania, founded by Benjamin Franklin, uh, and later would become home to the uh, a second vanguard medical school, which is Jefferson, and we'll talk about that a little later. But to give you an idea of what Philadelphia was like at this time period, a period I loved researching, I'm going to bring up a local poet uh, who has been in the scene for 11 years here, and he's going to read a little bit about what 19th century was like. Please welcome up to the stage, Jeff Knight. So I, I had started reading the book, and I was, you know, struck with, you know, this dashing, handsome, charming figure. And then Kristen asked me if I would come read, and I thought, well, of course. <laughs> and and then I looked at the passage she sent. <laughs> Chapter eleven, the root of the problem. Crushing poverty had become an everyday fixture of Philadelphia life. One neighborhood, the relatively small area between 5th and 8th streets from Lombard to Fitzwater had become so crammed with the city's most degraded classes that it earned the nickname the Infected District. A reporter from the Evening Bulletin investigated the harrowing neighborhood and found conditions among the four to 5,000 people who lived there so wretched that he felt incapable of reporting their full horrors to his readers. This area of the city, less than a mile from where Jefferson Medical College held its classes, seemed like a different world from the rarefied circles in which the doctors of the city drank imported French wine while dining on oysters, terrapin, quail, and ice cream. In the infected district, it was common practice for shops to charge a penny for a meal that was made up entirely of scraps bagged from the, I'm sorry, excuse me, um, entirely of scraps begged at the back doors of the wealthy. Unable to afford rent at even the lowliest of flop houses, it was a common custom for one enterprising individual to secure a room at a boarding house for 12 and a half cents a day and then sublet as many sleeping spaces as could fit at the bargain price of two cents a head. The police and fire department at the time were of little help. The police were known as watchmen because the uniformed men could, and often did, lock themselves in specially constructed watch boxes to protect themselves from the same criminals from which they were supposed to be protecting the community. The watch box method would be abandoned, however, when rioting mobs realized they could simply destroy the watch boxes and kill the police officers. The fire department was equally troubled. The all-volunteer companies were neighborhood-based, and just like the neighborhoods they had sworn to protect, some were very respectable, while others were the reverse, as one doctor later observed. The more humble and gentle the name of the firefighting company, the more apt it was to be pugnacious, he recalled. For instance, the goodwill would fight anything at any time. Foundries, factories, and mills of all kinds could be found within the city's borders. There were mills for spinning cotton and weaving wool, factories that built locomotives, fire engines, and chandeliers. The factories of Philadelphia produced, at their height, nearly one-fourth of the nation's steel, and the city's 12 sugar refineries made it the country's largest single supplier of commercial sugar. To keep this extraordinary confluence of businesses going, these factories, mills, and foundries needed workers. But the city's exploding population always seemed to contain more eager workers than were needed. Philadelphians were often forced by circumstance to accept abysmal wages for what invariably proved to be long hours of relentlessly grueling work. Unskilled factory operatives, coal heavers, shipyard workers, and carpenters were paid less than a dollar a day to work 14 hours a day, six days a week. 
Most factories recognized only the 4th of July as a holiday.